Jean-Jacques Hublin, please, the stage is yours. Thank you. Um, good evening to everyone, and thank you for the invitation for this um, meeting. Um, I'm not sure I can tell you everything about uh, the oldest the most sapien, but I'll try to give you uh, the essential. Um, let me share my screen with you first. Yep. Okay, so um, as it was said in the introduction, I would like to center my uh, talk on the uh, North African evidence, especially Northwest uh, Africa, uh, and especially the works we have done in, uh, in Morocco. Um, today, there, is, uh, there are homo sapiens, our species, everywhere on the planet, and our species has been able to colonize all sorts of environments, even the most difficult. And uh, we're even talking about going to another planet like Mars soon after going to the moon. Humans are even able to survive in, uh, in the space. Um, so all this has been made possible, of course, by a lot of technical improvements in the course of our evolution. And you have here a picture of a family in the Arctic and these humans uh, who are of uh, tropical origin can survive in this environment because they have all sorts of devices uh, that make their uh, life possible. And humans are very good at uh, creating um, their own environment uh, at different scale. And other important things about humans is that they're also very good at creating networks and networks of individuals that uh, go much beyond the nuclear family, like, like this one. And, and this networking is also a key of our success as, as a species. One feature that I think is really important to consider is also that today there is only one, one sort of humans on Earth. There is only one species of humans. And this looks to us like a, a normal situation. But in fact, if we move back in, in past, not very uh, far, uh, the picture is very different. This is a tree of uh, hominins like paleoanthropologists like to draw with different lines representing different uh, forms of hominins, different species. And what you see is uh, if you consider the complexity of this tree for let's say the last million year, you see that, uh, in fact, in the past, there was almost always different species of humans coexisting on the planet. Um, and especially on this, um, on this tree, you see on the left, bars corresponding to species uh, that lived in Eurasia, especially Neanderthals, which are this kind of dark uh, pink uh, bar, uh, Denisovans, the brown bar on the, on the left, and on the right side, you have blue bars representing even more archaic hominins um, that lived in, um, in Asia. And only one bar in the middle, this orange bar, which is our species, comes to the top of the frame, which means reach the present. So in other words, the fact that there is only one species on Earth of humans is a very recent uh, phenomenon, something that prevailed only for the last say. Uh, 40,000 uh, years or so. And when we talk about different species of hominins, it's something that is nothing uh, compared to what we have today in terms of diversity. Of course, today we have humans who are a little bit different from one continent to another, but these differences are, are literally cosmetic. And, and, uh, and, and when we look back in past, let's say 50,000 years ago, the, the, the kind of diversity we had is, is very different. For example, here on the right, you have a picture showing a hominin that lived in, in, in Indonesia until like 50,000 years ago. 
And it's really a creature that is very different from us. It's not more than a meter high and has a brain like a, a grapefruit. Uh, it's, it's a very different uh, creature. So among all this diversity of hominins, there are some species that uh, have been dominant in the last half million years, and especially uh, groups with very large brain. And among these very large brain hominins, uh, basically we have three groups, Neanderthals, Homo sapiens, our species, and these Asian uh, Denisovans. In this, in this chart, you have uh, the values of what we call encephalization quotient, which is not the size of the brain, but it's the size of the brain in relation to the body size, which is something more uh, meaningful. And you see that uh, there was a, a, a spectacular increase of this encephalization quotient in some groups uh, in the course of the last uh, um, half million year. And if we look at the map, we see that the distribution of these large brain hominins is uh, largely resulting from the existence of geographical uh, barriers and, uh, and also from distance. So uh, as I mentioned already, we have Eurasian forms with Neanderthals in Western Eurasia, sometimes extending to Central Asia uh, as far as the Altai. This is the white uh, dashed uh, areas. In the East, uh, because of isolation by distance, primarily you have these Denisovans, another uh, group of large brain hominins connected to Neanderthal somehow. And our species for a long time has been evolving only in Africa. And with these this brown uh, lines that you see on the, on, the, on the continent. And if I want to make a, a, a very long story short, uh, the story of uh, recent hominin evolution is just the expansion of Homo sapiens out of Africa and the replacement with a partial absorption of all the other groups that led to the current situation where we have only uh, one species of, uh, of hominins on, on Earth. So what are the arguments for this African origin of our species? First of all, they come from uh, genetics, and this is something that has been unveiled in the, already in the 80s. Um, this tree that you want, this complex uh, kind of diagram sh show you an arborescence, a tree of one part of the genome, very simple that we call mitochondrial DNA. And you say that you, you see that you have all sorts of ramifications and uh, the root of the tree is on the left, on the, on the top left of my chart. And all the lines that you see are um, uh, maternal uh, lines uh, because this part of the DNA is only uh, transmitted by females. And everything that is green is in Africa. And the, all the variety of these uh, lineages that we find out of Africa, which are not green, they derive from one branch of this complex an old African tree. So if you basically, if you turn upside down this picture, you have the picture of a tree growing in Africa with one branch going over the tree of the neighbors. And this is the branch that gave all the non-African population. And also starting in the 80s, 70s, we also started to realize that we had in Africa, fossil hominins that look not exactly like present day humans, but which were not very far in terms of anatomy with a range of age going uh, up to 200,000 years ago, when in the rest of Eurasia, we have very few evidence of Homo sapiens, uh, I would say older than 100,000 or something like that. And for most Eurasia is more something like 50,000. Another thing is archeologists told us uh, about in the same time period, the uh, 70s, 80s of the 20th century that we have in Africa, the oldest evidence 
of what we call cultural modernity. And cultural modernity, it's a very uh, contentious topic among um, paleoanthropologists, but um, it's not just technical complexity. It's also the fact that in, in these African groups, we see the development of um, behaviors that are um, evidenced by non-utilitarian objects. Like for example, these pierced shells on the right of my screen. And these objects are objects that had um, a meaning in terms of um, showing what is the social status of individuals or the, the, social, the cultural identity of groups. Uh, they could have been also involved in some kind of uh, trade um, exchanges between groups. In other words, we see that uh, I would say the non-utilitarian uh, activity of humans become increasingly important. Does not mean it did not exist in Neanderthals or Denisovans, but what we see is that in Africa this developed earlier and uh, and much more. And all this led to the idea that we had in Africa a sort of Garden of Eden. Uh, where uh, our species developed uh, rather suddenly about 200,000 years ago. And because of these discoveries uh, of uh, hominins and uh, artifacts were mostly occurring in East Africa and South Africa, the general consensus was that this Garden of Eden was, yeah, somewhere in this corner of the continent. So a small area, maybe somewhere in the uh, around the Rift Valley or something like that. But the fact is that this evidence was very weak because of the bias in the record of um, uh, archaeological sites and, and the preservation of fossil hominids. And I want to take you to another part of Africa, which is Morocco, Northwest Africa, where we could demonstrate that this model of um, Garden of Eden was actually uh, to be revised. Uh, I take you here in this landscape, uh, not very far from the, the Atlas Mountains that you see uh, at the horizon. We're on the top of a hill on the site, it's called Jebel Iroud between Marrakesh and Safi. And um, you have here the site on a, uh, the map and the site is also behind me. Uh, and in this site in the 60s, uh, one started to find hominins that were rather difficult to interpret because uh, these hominins were um, rather primitive in their shape in many aspects and their age was a bit mysterious. Here you have a letter of the um, the, the, the medical doctor of a, a, a mine of barite uh, that was on this hill of Jebel Iroud. And this letter documents the discovery of the first uh, skull that was ever found in, in Jebel Iroud. Uh, I've been interested in these fossils for, for a long time um, because they actually, they did not fit in the picture we had of, of uh, human evolution. They were not Neanderthals like in Europe, but they were not like this early form of modern Homo sapiens that we had in East Africa. Their age was uh, thought to be rather uh, recent. So uh, the general idea was that they were some kind of archaic form of hominins that survived in this corner of Africa when the real story was unfolding further east. So, for many years, I've been convinced that the, the, the key aspects of, of, for the interpretation of this hominid was their age. And the problem was, it was difficult to uh, establish this age without resuming excavation in the sites, which is something we did uh, in the years, starting in the years 2000, four or five uh, gradually. And we have been conducting works in this site for many years with my uh, Moroccan colleagues here on, the, on, the, on this picture you see on the right side uh, with a, a yellow uh, t-shirt, uh, my, my colleague and friend, uh, Abdel Wahed Benser, who is 
was the current co-director of this project. And also uh, an American colleague, uh, Shannon McFerrin, with this nice uh, baseball cap that um, has been uh, central also in this, in this project. I don't have time to develop all the discoveries that occurred in the site, but the important thing is that we could excavate a, uh, uh, a stratified part of the site where there was uh, quite a lot of archaeology and uh, faunal remains and all sorts of archaeological remains. All the yellow spots that you see in this, uh, in this uh, slide um, documents burned flints. And burned flints are very interesting to archaeologists because uh, it's a way to establish the age of archaeological layers by a method called thermoluminescence. And with this method, it has been possible to revise the age of the site. The other aspect of our works has been the discovery of uh, many more hominins in the site. And we have uh, up to 22 fossil uh, remains that have been uh, unearthed, representing uh, five individuals, um, uh, adults, adolescents, and uh, children. And by, by far, is, uh, this site is now uh, the richest of Africa for this time period. Uh, as I said, uh, thermoluminescence and also uh, uh, electronic spin resonance method allowed us to revise the site uh, age, and we found out that this age is around 300,000. And importantly, uh, the anatomical features of, of this uh, hominin when they were investigated showed that we were dealing with a, a, a more primitive version than the Homo sapiens that had been found in East and South Africa. And so in other words, it was not a, uh, a big surprise finally that this hominin from Irud were more primitive than these uh, East African fossils, just because they were older in fact. And so basically the two uh, main conclusions of the works in Irud were that a, our species was, was much older than we thought, um, going beyond 300,000 first and not 200,000. Second, that there was no some kind of Adamic emergence of an Homo sapiens somewhere in a garden of Eden, but more likely a very gradual uh, evolution uh, leading to the, to the emergence of, um, of what we call modern Homo sapiens. And we see especially this gradual evolution with the, the brain. Um, what you have here on the left is a, um, a geometric analysis of the shape of the, of the brain in all these hominins. Uh, positions of uh, dots on this chart or, this, or the surface of these polygons represent in fact differences in shape. Uh, that are simplified and represented in two dimensions. So starting uh, with uh, very primitive hominins on the, on the left, Homo erectus that live you know, a million years ago or more. Uh, we have going to the right, uh, a large um, red tr triangle that is representing um, Neanderthals. And all the blue purple uh, kind of polygons represent different groups of Homo sapiens of different ages. And what you see on this chart is that when you go from left to right, what you mostly have is an increase of size. And when you go, when you move vertically in, the, in, the, in this um, two dimensional space, what you have is a change of shape and what basically we, we showed with uh, the study of the Irud material and some other early hominin is that in fact, what, what happened in our species is not so much a, a continuous increase of brain size, like what was going on with Neanderthals and other hominins, but mostly a change in shape and a reorganization of the brain. And you have this shown on the right side of the slide, showing some of these changes 
uh, especially with changes affecting a part of the brain that's in the back that we call the, the, cere the cerebellum. Um, and, uh, and we think that probably all these changes in the brain are important also in the, the changes of behavior of, of these hominids. And, and the important thing is that the brain is a very costly organ in terms of energy. And so our species found a way I mean, natural selection of our species found a way to improve the performance of our brain without increasing too much the size, which is very costly, as I said, in terms of energy. So if we look at the uh, archaeological record, uh, we see that together with these very early uh, humans, uh, Homo sapiens, we have a new brand of tools that we call in Africa Middle Stone Age or MSA. And in Jebel Irud, we have the oldest form of this MSA. Uh, interestingly, we find MSA very soon after in many other places in East and South Africa. And we have good reason to think that the development of these new behaviors is related to the exp expansion of our species. So what we're saying is not that Homo sapiens originated in Morocco. Well, there was no Morocco 300,000 years ago. Uh, but um, that probably by 300,000, our species was probably present in many uh, places in Africa already. And the emergence of what we call modern Homo sapiens, it's something that uh, probably involved different uh, groups of uh, African Homo sapiens that sometimes were represented population that were isolated one from the others, sometimes connected depending on the uh, environment and the climatic, climatic evolution. And among this Middle Stone Age, this is where we see this so called uh, uh, cultural modernity developing. And you have here a map showing the diversification of archaeological assemblages in Africa during the late Middle Stone Age, let's say after uh, 150,000 years ago, and the development of these kind of uh, non utilitarian or so called symbolic objects that I already mentioned, like these um, pierced shells that are found by hundreds in some South African or uh, Moroccan. Um, sites. So at the end of the story, I told you uh, our species started to expand out of Africa. And that could be the topic of an entire lecture, but I just want to say a few words about that. Uh, initially, we think that the reason why our species expanded out, out of Africa uh, is mostly because of environmental changes. And uh, Africa in the past was not what Africa is today. And in particular, in the last um, million year or half million year, what we see is that although there is an increase of aridity in Africa, there are episodes where uh, moist conditions prevail again for short period, I mean short periods, short periods of several millennia, which for humans is quite long. And during these Green Sahara episodes, uh, Sahara is, you know, green. I mean, not green like Normandy, but we have uh, rivers and lakes, you know, which are shown in this, in this map. Uh, and we have part of, the, part of the Sahara covered with savannas and fauna that were exploded by uh, these hunter-gatherers of the Middle Stone Age. And this, this Green Sahara episodes are mostly connected to a move of what we call the um, uh, intertropical uh, convergence uh, zone, uh, which is basically the limit uh, where the monsoon coming from the Guinea Gulf can move into the, into the, the Sahel. And sometimes it moves very high and goes uh, south of the Maghreb. And then you have these Green Sahara episodes. Um, One minute so left. As I said, we have lakes and rivers. Uh, and the important thing is that 
these green star episodes here, you, they are represented by bars on this uh, chronological chart, did not develop not just in, the, in, in Africa, but actually in all the zone where today we have deserts between the Persic Gulf and the Atlantic. And so in other words, when we had green Sahara episodes, we also had green Arabia episodes. And this kind of conditions also prevailed uh, east of the Red Sea. And probably it's in a, in a rather, I would say, passive way than uh, these humans expanded in this area out of Africa, just because they were, you know, uh, expanding in their ecogeographic natural uh, niche. So it was not a, a migration, it was more like a dispersal in, in an environment that was favorable to their uh, way of living. And we have trace of African forms of hominins in the Levant. Uh, there is a site uh, in Israel where we have around 180, 190 trace of these uh, African hominins. And in the, in the following, um, say, 100,000 years, it looks like there are several sort of uh, pulses of these African populations in, the, in Southwest Asia. And this is a, a moment where we have uh, contacts with Neanderthals that live in the area, uh, hybridization, and many people today see the, the Levant and Southeast, uh, Southwest, uh, excuse me, Southwest Asia as a zone of uh, hybridization between these species. And later, uh, these hominins are going to expand even further uh, high in, um, in, in northern latitudes, and they are going to reach uh, the mid latitudes of Eurasia, in Europe in particular. And interestingly, uh, this, this last expansion of our species higher in latitude seems to be completely unrelated to environmental changes. So initially it was environment, but later it looks like it's more uh, cultural changes. What, what I underline in the beginning of my talk, I mean, uh, not just technical complexity, but also social complexity that allowed this tropical population, you know, they were, they were black Africans eh, moving in Europe and these guys, the oldest one that we have in Europe, they are uh, occurring in a, a, a climate that is comparable to the climate of today's, um, nowadays, uh, Scandinavia or Norway or something like that. And at, at this point, it's, 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 it's really uh, culture and, and, and cultural complexity that prevails. And you have here a tree showing again uh, these Homo sapiens, these Neanderthals, these Denisovans, it's a slightly different tree than what I showed you in the beginning. And you see all these red arrows between this line show you integration of uh, DNA from one group into another. And this is a very simplified um, scheme showing that during this expansion, this final expansion, and actually it started already in the Near East with the first uh, pulse of African population out of Africa, um, we have a replacement, but we also have a partial uh, absorption of local population. And today, uh, all non-African humans in Asia, in, in, uh, in, in Europe, or in, in America, they carry a little bit of DNA of these Neanderthals and Denisovans. We need to conclude. Okay, I thank you for your attention. And just to end, I show you this cover of Newsweek magazine uh, from uh, 1988, when the first um, uh, analysis of mitochondrial DNA in humans was um, published and when this notion of an African origin uh, started to be accepted by scientists and the public. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have a very short time for, for questions. Uh, do we have questions? Mm, not yet. 
Um, I, I, I was wondering actually what evidence we you have about the the ecology of the of the hominin in the in the Moroccan site and how it compares to to Eastern Africa. Well, actually, uh, during the, the late Middle Pleistocene, uh, as I said, we, we have this increase of aridity, uh, but still we have a landscape that looks pretty much like what we would see today in East Africa. And so in other words, it means that this divide between, um, you know, that we see today between the, the, the Maghreb and the Mediterranean world and the, the, the African, uh, environments of East and West Africa is, is something that developed, um, I would say, rather recently. Uh, but again, you have to imagine moments in the um, uh, late Middle Pleistocene and Upper Pleistocene where you had in North Africa, savannas with zebras and giraffes and gazelles uh, just like what you, and wildebeest, like what you see today in African uh, game reserves. And this is the kind of, of animals that this, these guys were um, uh, hunting and living on. Okay. Uh, we have one question uh, from Charlotte Marie. What is the basis for the theory that it was cultural changes that drove the final expansion? Well, um, I, I mentioned already the fact that uh, uh, large brain hominins like Neanderthal, Denisovan, Homo sapiens uh, were so, sort of evolving in parallel for a long time. And we see an increase of complexity in technology and other aspects in all these groups. Uh, but, but what we see uh, at the time of the replacement is that basically uh, what, what's going on with all species is, is going faster. And so, uh, uh, for example, this, this, uh, this, this Homo sapiens moving into Europe 45,000 years ago, they carry spectacular non-utilitarian objects like this, this pendants I showed you which is something that is very, uh, I would say, uh, rare in the Neanderthal world. And we also have this evidence that uh, these guys, they expand very quickly uh, in higher latitude, like Western Siberia, north of the Himalaya, uh, basically uh, ignore, I mean, not ignoring completely environmental changes but they can cope with environments which are absolutely non-tropical, which was not the case before. And by 30,000 years ago, these guys, these humans, they are able to live on the shores of the Arctic Sea, what no other hominins has been able to do before. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for again for this great talk. Uh, thank you, everyone, to, to, to be here. Uh, the time is over, unfortunately, for this session. So I invite you now to, to assist to the, to the other session. If you have uh, further questions for uh, Jean-Jacques Cublin, you can also uh, use the networking tool of the, of the conference. Thank you very much. Goodbye.